Hello, good evening. So, uh, I'm the last one, and I, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you to, to accompany me, you know, in this last uh, lecture, or last intervention of, um, of the day. I'll try to be, and I, I can't promise that I'll be brief, I'll try to stick to, to the half an hour that I have, uh, that I have established, but um, I'll try to, to be quick, or, or not to be too boring. I mean, I... Yes, you know, the worst thing that a speaker can be is being boring. And of course, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated to be in Estonia. It's one of those countries that from down south, or one looks up north, it's a tiny country with an interesting name. And uh, I had been to Lithuania, but Lithuania is larger. So uh, I wanted to be in one of the real small ones of them. <clears throat> Okay, um, just, um, you know, I, I put in this slide because I, I want to differentiate what I'm going to do with what other colleagues of mine have done while studying populism. I was led to study populism because I didn't understand why it um, was rehabilitated and it had um, such an impact in the, last, in the last years. So I started reading, and somehow we can find several explanations. Some of them we've been, um, we've been uh, I think we're all familiar with most of those uh, explanations. There's a socioeconomic uh, explanation, there's a cultural, psychosocial um, explanation. And then this, what I think, what I consider to be the most interesting explanation, which is populism is somehow the answer to a crisis of liberal democracy. So it's somehow as if liberal democracy, and I would say um, politics itself, doesn't have an answer to some of the, of the ills that we're experiencing through globalization, through, let's say, through trouble in the psychosocial dimension. As you know, resentment, which is uh, quite a familiar a feeling, is, uh, is, a typical, uh, is a typical effect, typical passion of uh, presumed equalitarian societies. So, and, and the idea that throughout the whole day, one term didn't, didn't show up, maybe I didn't hear it, I think I, I'll have to bring it, bring it into the discussion, which is the idea of inequality. I think our societies are far more um, unequal than they used to be. It has a lot to do with the socioeconomic factors, of course. And um, <clears throat> to try to give my opinion on some of the, of the issues that have been dealt with uh, before, what I would like to say is that, you know, the, the question is somehow um, how good or how threatening is populism to liberal democracy? So um, is this an opportunity, as we knew from our Dutch, Van Klik uh, explained, or is this a threat? And I think it's both. I. Uh, I wrote somewhere, I think it was in the, in the newspapers, so um, not in a, not in a um, social science paper. Uh, I read that populism nowadays is, uh, you know, we can, we can give it a term that comes from Greek that had been deeply analyzed by uh, Jacques Derrida, which is the term pharmacon, uh, because pharmacon um, has two opinions opposed meanings. It means medicine and it means poison. So it depends on the quantity that you take. If you take too much of a certain, you know, of uh, something that's presumed to be good for your body, you may die, but if you take, if you take the, right, the right amount, then you'll, be, you'll become healthier. And I think that's exactly what happens with populism. I think populism has shown, um, has shown us all 
that we have a problem with the way our institutions work, that we have a problem with the way that elites are being uh, doing their job, and that something has to be done. But having a populist in a place like the United States for a second term may turn into a pharmacon in the sense of, <clears throat> of a poison. So um, beware. Hmm? So I think it, it swings both ways. So it's, it's ambivalent. So it, it, it might be interpreted as something good, but on the other hand, it can be interpreted as something, as something bad. Uh, of course, Chantal has, has interpreted it in the, in the good, um, in the good uh, sense, of course. Um, but what I, what I was going to, to dwell on is, is more on, on another factor that is, has, of course, been widely uh, researched, which is the technological factor. I think we are we're in the midst of a technological revolution, and this technological revolution does have, of course, an impact on the way we practice politics. And, it, and I think, and this will be my main thesis, the problem is that we are restructuring the, the public sphere in a way throughout these new, techn new technologies that um, populist discourses have a better chance of being uh, listened to or being, uh, having an impact than ordinary political ideologies, if you want. But uh, no, I wanted to, I wanted to specify what is my, my conception of populism. Uh, I think populism is a logic of political action. This I, I in agreement with Laclau and, uh, and uh, Mouffe, of course. It's not an ideology, no matter how, how thin. And I think that the formulas or styles employed, the kind of rhetoric in use and the way in which it aspires to gain supremacy are all more important than doctrinal content itself. So populism is, populism is mainly a political mobilization strategy. Huh? And it's being put into practice in performative activism, in public interventions, in communications, in framing stereotypes that facilitate the construction of a we, huh? and it's in its contrast with the opponent. So if, if it has to do with representation, with performance, as I said, as Van Klink has, uh, I think, uh, uh, greatly um, tried to show us, um, then I think populism has an advantage in this new restructuring of the public sphere. Why? Okay, so this would be, my thesis is that, so we have, we have made a transit from media democracy to digital democracy. Of course, you know, don't worry, I'm not going to define what's media democracy and what's digital democracy. I think the, the key factor here is the development of new communication um, uh, technologies. I think the important thing, you know, to, to look at is, uh, at the way the polit politics is represented. So as, as you know, um, polit and when we talk about media democracy, it is because the stage where politics is represented are exclusively the mass media. Hmm? And we can notice a shift from a more intellectualized politics to a more simplified politics when we switch from the press to the radio, then to television. And then within this paradigm of media democracy, it's, I mean, this, it's not a coincidence that, uh, you know, the revival of rightist populism in Italy, for instance, through Berlusconi, is linked to private television channels, for instance. Right? So, I don't know if Massimo would agree with me, but in a way this is the infrastructure, you know, that use populists in order to present their, their discourse, or in order to act as such. So, and now um, 
we stage politics in the digital sphere. So, uh, and this has this has a lot of um, a lot of consequences. I would say, I'll go very very quickly through this because it's well known. You know, Habermas, you know, says that um, we have lost a common public world, and this is the real problem that we have because there are only disorganized public spheres, and this this uh, common public world that we used to have has been substituted by fragmented media, consumerism, mainly through social media. Here, we are under, under the position of the logic of the swarm, all through um, consume that's based on privatization, so that's what Negro Ponti called the my daily me. I have my daily me, as, as, as I guess most of you, you know, when you open the you open the, your mail, you, you, you know what to read, you know, because you've received exactly those, um, those news that you wanted, or those subjects that you wanted, that you're interested in. And of course, there are the, the eco chambers, and the eco chambers, I think, play an important role in, in, the, in the new public sphere. But I, I would. Um, I would, I, would, I would also underline the idea that the public sphere has been balkanized, has been polarized. It's uh, mainly a subject to emotions. It's subject to fuss, to noise. But the, um, and the, the main consequences, though, are that the, um, this um, eco chambers uh, also facilitate the creation of communities among the like-minded. I think this is interesting because, because real communities are being undermined in the real world, but they, are, they can be reconstituted in, the cyber, in cyberspace. And this creates, this facilitates that radicals don't consider themselves to be somehow uh, part of, of, of um, part of, let's say, of, of a minority within society, because they always, they can always meet people like them. So they 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 start realizing that being a Nazi is not that um, different. There are thousands of Nazis, and I can meet them in my eco chamber, right? So this this has created the possibility of legitimizing positions, political positions that were taboo hmm? before they, these people had the chance of entering communication with, with, um, with like-minded. But the, the language is reactive, so there's a lack of dialogue or argumentation. It reinforces resentment and hate speech. And then another trait that I think it's interesting, it's that it has created um, a new virtual reality, which is also the object of general information. And I'll, let, me, let me try to explain a little bit further what, what I mean by that, because I think this is quite interesting. The problem is not split between, let's say, ordinary traditional media and the cyberspace. I think the main problem is that the traditional media are increasingly observing what is happening in cyberspace, and so they don't look at reality, or to a supposed reality, but they look at the way this reality is being observed from, you know, through the internet or the social media. So in a way, we have meta-observations in the, in the traditional media. So we observe how People observe reality within Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. So in the end, we, we no longer know what the facts are. We only know what reactions those facts really provoke in this new, in this new uh, reality. Well, what are the effects? I think this is, um, well, my point is that um, the first effect, which I think it's, um, well, uh, we all suffer from it, is a continuous loss of auctoritas. Um, 
suffered by every stance or domain of power. Uh, what I mean to say, I use this, this, this term in Latin, auctoritas, because it, I think it's, it's, it has more force than authority. Hmm? And of course there's authority, but there's no longer auctoritas. I mean, I have authority vis-a-vis -vis my students, but I lost my auctoritas when they realized I mean, I've been corrected by students because they enter into internet and they can check if it's right what you say. Well, from that moment on, you're naked, right? In front of your students. So you lost your divine uh, presence. So you're, you, you become a mortal. Why? Simply because that that was supposed to be what sustained your authority, which is having a certain knowledge, uh, they have realized that they can have an access, a direct access to that knowledge without me. You know what I mean? So this is what I mean by loss of authorities. But it's the same thing that happened to doctors. You know, all my friends who Practice medicine, tell me, you know, they have to negotiate with the patients, you know, what they have. Or if they give them a certain medicine or not. Why? Because they have, before going to the physician or to the doctor, they have already checked on the internet, you know, what they may have or may not have or what the effects are of taking certain, certain medicines. Okay, this is, again, loss of auctoritas on part of the doctors, but of course they have authority, yeah? because you need the signature in order to be capable of, die, of buying something. Well, this is what has also happened to politicians, institutions, hmm? because they, they, the way that they are being contemplated in this new, in this new um, public, uh, public sphere is different, and experts, as you know, populists are always, um, always love to shoot on experts. Hmm? And I think they're right in part, because I've read, or well, we can all read um, an article on, by uh, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, where he says that, you know, the restriction of, of um, <clears throat> The restriction of the budget is good for the health of, of the national economy. And then next week, you find the opposite op opinion on part of another Nobel Prize winner saying exactly the contrary. And we all know that different factions can hire different experts. So that experts you know, are no longer, this is the word, trusted. Trusted, they also have have somehow uh, lost part of their authority. And this is particularly the case of uh, traditional communication media. I mean, this is there's a crisis in intermediation simply because we don't need politicians, don't need newspapers anymore. Donald Trump can't send can send tweets, right? So and then he can allow himself something which is extraordinary, which is to say, New York Times, Washington Post, that's fake news. It's like Sarrazin in Germany talked about the Lügenpresse. So that it's all lies. So they, they, they turn completely, you know, the, the presumption. The presumption is the New York Times says the truth. It's... Uh, Fox News that distorts the truth, and then, but he can allow himself, you know, to, to have a direct communication with, with citizens. Before, I mean, just 10, 15 years ago, um, in order to have that communication, one had to go to the traditional media and work on those media. And then the, the third point, which I think it's, uh, it's also important to, to see is that there is a fire battle for the attention market. The problem is that there's too much 
offering. Hmm? So we need to, uh, to, so we live in an economy of, of attention. And the, the problem is that every human being has a limited attention span. Hmm? You can see this was full this morning, now <laughs> it's, <clears throat> it's not as full, I mean, it's, it's logical, so people cannot attend for four or five hours, right? So and that's what generally happens. So then what do traditional media and social media too in order to gain attention? So who gets more attention? So I think this affects um, what to inform about, what is worthy of uh, achieving the status of the news. Hmm? So um, what do we focus when we have to inform about something? And the second, and I think this is the really important uh, point, is how to inform. So the idea here is that what um, you have to decide what staging tools to use, what wrappings, what wrapping will be used to transmit what is newsworthy. How to inform, for instance, entertaining, Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's in, in, infotainment is therefore that important, and I think um, all, the, um, all the news are subject to the requirements of surprise, the happening, dramatization, storytelling, aesthetization, and to an increasingly heightened accelerating dynamics. So acceleration also is one of the traits, you know, of this new public... Um, public sphere, how much does a trending topic last? Um, three or four years ago, it lasted for about 24 hours, maybe more. Now it lasts for about half an hour, a couple of hours. So it's, it's uh, moving uh, extremely fast. Scandalization is, of course, also something that attracts att uh, attention. I, I recall that Niklas Luhmann quoted Baudelaire referring to his dog, and he made the comparison between the Baudelaire's dog and the public. And he's, uh, Baudelaire supposed to have said, um, the surprising thing about my dog is that he's much more interested in, <clears throat> in, um, mm, in shit than in perfume, um, which we all know, we who have dogs know pretty well. So, so let's say the, the consumers of news are more interested in scandal, scandals than in, you know, in, in, a, in a very highly intellectualized discussion on whatever subject. And then the other thing that attracts attention is, of course, emotionality. So we are sentient beings, and we are, we are uh, trapped by emotions. And this is, nowadays, I think this is one of the, one of the key subjects um, in, um, in some literature that are, are, um, are um, recovering something that we abandoned, because we would too much concerned about, how, about cognition, about um, rational discourse, about rational deliberation, and suddenly, you know, it's this revival of emotions, so which is, as we have been seeing throughout the day, it's something that's also um, one of the main, one of the main um, traits of, of, of populism. So, and, and uh, what we, are seeing from the results of the new research is the practical impossibility of distinguishing reason from effects, thinking and feeling, both always appear intertwined in one way or another. You can remember someone as rational as Thomas Hobbes said, yeah, but no, we, we, are, we have the impulse of to think because we have the passion, as he called it, of curiosity. So there's, there's no way to distinguish both. And then those people, you know, that have, um, uh, are, 
are in cognitive psychology and in in uh, in, in brain brain science and so on. So we are discovering new um, new research that somehow has come to the same conclusion. So and this is known on part of of new um, communication experts. And of course, the tool is how to create a discourse that's based mainly on, mainly on, um, on, on the effects. And here, the the well, I'm not entering into this of the well, narratives, storytelling, of course, frames, how to define, you know, what is, how to frame reality, or the power of the bodies, how we interact when we have. Physically, we're among other bodies, which is something that happens when we, not just when we are at the soccer game, but also when we are participate from a demonstration. So Judith Butler has studied you know, this dimension in particular. And then there is something that I think it's uh, highly important, which is tribal morality, as uh, Jonathan Haidt has called it. And, um, and I think this is, this is quite interesting because um, trial morality refers to the idea that moral judgment is a case of us versus them rather than right versus wrong. So morality is supposed to be based on the code right, wrong, and politics or um, let's say factional politics is based on the idea of us versus them. So what we see is that both dimensions collapse into a single one. Hmm? So as Jonathan say, uh, Haidt says, morality binds and blinds. It binds us to the group and blinds us to the point of view of outsiders. And this has profound implications for how we might think about some of our most deeply held beliefs. For instance, it means that we be, that what we believe is less important, attention, than with whom we share those beliefs. So the important thing is that I share the belief huh, of those that are like those that are like me. Well, this is typical from nationalism, for instance. You know the the this jingoist uh, expression right or wrong, my country, right? So, I mean, I don't care if it's bad what our president has decided to execute Osama bin Laden or whoever, <clears throat> you know, it's done in the name of reason of state, so I back it, so I, I buy it, you know, as being a necessary undertaking. So and this is, something that we can perceive in, in populist discourse. So when we make this split between us and them, we moralize it. So we, the, the code right or wrong becomes the same, the moral code becomes the same as, as the, the other one. Well, post-truth or tribal, what's also called tribal epistemology, which is the, the tendency to be convinced by that um, on which I have already a prejudice, so to say, or by being convinced by how I, um, how I feel about a, a particular issue, right? So there's this constraints that avoids that I have, I can have a more neutral point of view. Well, this is what lies behind the idea of post-truth, you all know about it, it has been um, debated a thousand times. Um, I think the the, the question here is whoever feels more intensely will also be instilled with more reason. So this is somehow the, the paradox. So what matters is not if something is true or not. What matters is only our truth, our conception of a certain thing. And then we're faced you know, with this you know, this world of scandals, fake news, of this uh, somehow the, this uh, disappearance of, of the facts um, with this continuous use of, of, um, 
of uh, computer screens or telephone screens or iPads or whatever, we end up fictionalizing facts and factification, factificating fictions. That's what can be called multimedia hybridization, so that the limits between reality and fiction are lost. Yeah, I have here a good example. This is a tweet, you know, it's, um, it's um, Trump with Putin. That picture is, came after we saw the, uh, the chapter of House of Cards where the supposed president meets the Russian president. So what happened in fiction took place before what happened afterwards uh, in reality. So how do we know about how the White House um, organizes its dealings in American politics? Through TV series or through political science treatises or through the press? We don't know in the end. I mean, so we're being constantly prejudiced. So this is this multimedia hybridization. And on the other hand, uh, a good way to present your political position is to fix them to, to fictions. You know, it, it, it's not a coincidence that Pablo, um, Pablo Iglesias, the first time that he met the Spanish king, um, gave him a present of the first, um, first series, I'm just say, of um, Game of Thrones. So it was symbolically a way of telling him, hmm, so this is our objective. Objective is to take your position. So we want your throne. You know, we want to be majoritarian. We want to be, huh? want to win this just as, you know, want to enter into the same fight that we are a witness in within, within that series. So, but I think this is the most, um, so if everything is up to uh, creating emotions, the real problem starts when, if emotions can be easily manipulated or controlled. And I think this is the, perhaps the most important, uh, the most worrisome um, issue nowadays regarding democracy, not just populism versus liberal democracy or whatever. Because the thing is that individual preferences, desires, and thoughts which were previously only accessible to individuals themselves. So you knew my preferences because I told you what my preferences were, right? They are now open to external observers. So it, which means to say that our mind is no longer a black box. Huh? Someone can look into our minds without our knowing it. How? through a digital footprint, of course. So you know what, um, you, know, you know the case with Cambridge Analytica, so it's, it's, a, it's quite easy, you know, to, to, uh, how to add preferences and then to attack those people, people holding those preferences um, with a certain propaganda, right? With using one picture or another picture. Yeah, three minutes. Uh, people who want to manipulate the elections use our weaknesses and our fears against us. And this will get much easier with uh, artificial intelligence. I, I quote the, um, a sentence by Harari uh, where he says something that you know, kept my attention. Once somebody gains the technological ability to manipulate the human heart reliably, cheaply, and at scale, democratic politics will mutate into an emotional puppet show. Look, I have here some examples. You remember that uh, picture and how much we were moved, you know, the, the poor child, you know, and which was probably one of the reasons why Merkel and in general the German public was so welcoming towards um, towards uh, Syrians. Hmm? So here is pity, empathy, 
No, this is the other way around. This is rage. This is hate. This was uh, in, in Cologne, in Köln, you know, the last, uh, um, how do you say, the uh, um, New Year's Eve, hmm? where um, some German girls were raped or were sexually attacked. And those pictures also had, of course, an important effect. Here again, pity, sympathy, empathy, here, fear. That's a, by the way, that's a, that's a beach where I spent some, um, <laughs> some summers. And suddenly I saw, <clears throat> you know, in, in, in the, the first front page of all the Spanish newspaper, the same picture. People that, you know, while the tourists or people having holidays were, were simply sitting on the beach, suddenly, you know, they felt how, you know, those people, those Africans suddenly appeared and they disappeared, you know, the, so this sensation of being invaded. So this creates, and this creates an immediate, an immediate um, reaction. And how could we counteract those reactions? Yeah. Well, this is a picture taken in 1939, Spanish Republicans fleeing the country through the Pyrenees. And so what, what I, I, I mean to transmit is that if you want to counteract, you know, those such a highly uh, emotionalized politics, you have to use the same tools. And I think this is what's really new. So you have to also hmm, create the same feelings. It's a way of saying, Spaniards, yeah, I mean, we have to accept those people. We also had to pass through, I mean, the, the torture of having to abandon their country. Okay, uh, is there a way out? Do we have the means to counteract both experts and populists? I don't think so. I, can, I think that deliberative democracy can help. But our main problem is, um, our main problem is really that this new construction or restructuring of the public sphere makes it, makes it um, increasingly more difficult. Thank you very much.